So you focus on understanding HIV transmission in the vaginal tract yes. and also understanding HIV transmission at a single cell level. So um, may you please explain why the vaginal tract is so permissible to HIV infection? Um, so so uh, HIV um, and related viruses have evolved to transmit through mucosal sites and mucosal sites have very unique cells. Um, it's almost like there's three immune systems. There's the immune system that's in the blood, and, and actually, and that's the one that's easiest to study, but it doesn't mean much. It'd be like studying people by what happens on highways. So it's just the transportation system. Then there's the immune system that's the lymphatics, you know, the lymph nodes and the spleen and, uh, and uh, appendix tonsils, these, these immune organs. <clears throat> and then the last um, uh, immune system is the mucosal immune system. And the mucosal immune system is, is basically facing the outside world. And so the most um, pathogens come from the outside world uh, and, and through the mucosal systems. This is, could be the lungs, yeah. female reproductive tract, the gut, um, uh, sort of wet, wet exposed surfaces. Even your eyes has certain characteristics like that. So, um, so, so, so there's some very um, uh, unique aspects um, in the female reproductive tract. I'll focus on that today, although we're also trying to understand um, rectal transmission and even uh, um, uh, oral transmission in infants and other other uh, uh, other modes of, of transmission. So the, um, the the CCR5, for instance, is a is a uh, the co-receptor for the virus. CCR5 is a signal or, or a detector for for um, chemokines. And, and cytokines that 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 bring those cells to the mucosal sites. So um, so people often talk about lymph nodes as being a key place where the virus replicates. This isn't really true. There's really about the same number of CCR5 positive cells in a lymph node as there are in the blood, which is is not so many. Um, so that's more. Again, it can depend, but you know probably less than 10 percent, um, maybe 5 percent, maybe up to 15 percent. Um, whereas you know, 60 to 80 percent of the of the cells, especially close to the surface yeah. of the mucosa, are CCR5. So, so that's that I would say is one of the main things that make it susceptible. And then uh, another thing that makes it highly susceptible is the virus needs um, metabolically active cells. The, the the virus needs nucleotides. The virus needs a cell that's awake and 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 working. And so. Um, uh, there's a lot of um, uh, cells waiting around at mucosal sites to maybe bump into their antigens, uh, these memory cells, and people focus on those memory cells, but, but there's other cell types, for instance, TH17s, TH22s, these other cell types at the mucosa that um, uh, their job is to kind of make sure the barriers are working. So they're, they're awake every day, they're interacting with dendritic cells every day, they're looking for their antigens every day. And those are, are the best targets for the virus. And those are the cells that are getting infected first. And, and that's why the female reproductive tract is, is highly susceptible. But the last thing is that it, it turns out, and um, I think this was a little unexpected, but the results are becoming very clear. The entire female reproductive tract is accessible to being infected from, from basically the uh, introitus, the, the, the labia, the, the outside aspects of the female reproductive tract, all the way to the ovaries. You can get infection throughout all of those surfaces. And all the virus cares about is bumping into a cell that, um, that it can, has CD4 on it, has CCR5 on it, and that can um, uh, provide the uh, necessary uh, reagents, the necessary supplies for the virus to make copies of itself and integrate. How has your research contributed to understanding HIV infection kinetics? Um, so that's, that's a great question because the, um, we, we, we really don't understand that aspect of things very well. Um, um, so we, we don't understand those aspects very well, and the um, uh, things I think are happening much faster. Um, so, so we're doing a lot of experiments, especially in, um, in rhesus macaques, and I have now finally have a toolbox that allows us to um, see all these things, you know, to see the virus moving, to follow virions, to follow infected cells, uh, etc. cetera. And, um, and so as we do that, um, we just see the virus is spreading much more quickly, um, than we expected. The, probably the life cycle of the virus is, is more um, quick. Um, uh, you know, we usually think we have to wait about 48 hours for the, um, the virus in a, in a tissue culture dish to make sure it's gone through uh, 
uh, complete infection cycle. When we go into a rhesus macaque, we find that there's probably at 48 hours, there's two complete rounds of replication have taken place already. And that's the virus being introduced into the system, um, distributing in the female reproductive tract, getting through the epithelial barriers, getting to a cell, infecting it, producing more virions and infecting more cells. It, that's how far we get in 48 hours in a macaque. And that is definitely faster than, than would be predicted. And the, um, one of the challenges is that we, we focus on the virus in the blood. And it turns out that our, our system, immune system, the lymphatic system is very good about filtering out things. It, it, it's an advantage to the immune system to keep the pathogen localized. And so um, that filtering system is so good that only after it kind of gets saturated does the virus start to spill in the blood. And, and that can take um, up to two weeks. And, um, uh, and, and we're finding um, you know, four days after, uh, uh, you know, very shortly after um, uh, a challenge uh, and other people are seeing the same things too. You see the virus is um, spread throughout, you know, even if it starts in the female reproductive tract, it'll spread to the gut, it'll spread to lymph nodes, it can spread to the spleen, it, it's spreading throughout um, any of these target cells that can get it. It gets to the lungs pretty quickly because the lungs have, are, are rich in these kinds of cells. So so the kinetics are, are much faster than we think um, uh, based on some of the emerging data. <laughs> Do you have any advice for any students or early career postdocs who are doing research in HIV? Um, you know, I, I think um, there's sort of the obvious things of, uh, of work hard and study hard, um, uh, and, and that'll all, all, all pay, pay you back. I think what, what young people need to try to do is the field is very mature, so there's a, a lot of the easier things are done yeah. and have been done well, and there's still a lot of important questions. In fact, some of the most important questions remain. So, um, so, so. so uh, and to study those, you need to kind of try to think about the future, think about what sort of uh, techniques are emerging, how can I use those emerging techniques to ask yeah. questions about HIV, and, um, and, and, and there's just a real advantage to, to being in, in front of that. The other thing is that in science, it's very important to have a network of people that you interact with, and that network should include people that are your peers, other students and postdocs, um, hopefully and eventually around the world. Um, because you're going to grow up with them. And so um, uh, at this meeting, for instance, um, uh, multiple people at this meeting that are also um, uh, lecturing and, um, and uh, are, uh, I've known for 20 or 25 years. And so, so th that makes for a very rich relationship and it, it makes it very easy to talk to them and learn to them and bounce ideas off of them and trust them. So, so I, I think that's a real important thing to have those peers and then also try to meet and, um, and interact with more senior people. And the, the neat thing about being a graduate student, and, and this becomes a little bit less, is a graduate student has like a, a card, a license that says, I can ask questions. Yeah. And they don't even have to be good questions because yes. I'm learning, right? So you have this license, and, and then when you become a postdoc, you sort of say, well, He's now I should know questions. more, so maybe I, I, sh I, I can't, you know, I have to be careful that I don't ask a, a really a bad question because, um, you know, the, people expect me to know more. And then, and then when you become old like me, you really, um, you know, should should know things. And so, so you really, if you if you add a bad, bad ask a bad question, um, it's it's really not very good. So, so I think if you kind of uh, build your network, uh, try to learn things, try to anticipate the future, and just be an enthusiastic participant in the enterprise, um, there's a good chance you can uh, you can thrive and uh, move forward in your career. Thank you for agreeing to be interviewed by Nina Pedia and sharing um, information about your research.